with me to Matthew, the 11th chapter. And the twelfth verse. Matthew, the eleventh chapter, and the twelfth verse. If you're still looking, say, Wait up. If you've got it, say, Amen. Amen. And it reads as so And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his holy word. You may be seated. <laughs> Let me first tell you how excited I am to be here today. Somebody's been praying for me because I, I wasn't quite sure whether or not I'd be able to do this. Because quite honestly, I'm going to miss that, yes sir, yes sir. Preacher, make it do what it do. But somebody prayed for me. And it's in that strength, by the, the guidance and the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that I'm able to stand here before you now. And I want you all to know that to our family, that there is no place on earth like Greater Ebenezer. The angel of this house, Dr. Jones, was the one who brought me to Jesus. Amen. And it was this house that so lovingly nourished our family, supported our family. This is where we came to know God. Right. And this is where we came to meet God. Right. And I am delighted to see you again. Amen. I've missed you and I love you. So our text is, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. It's time to fight, y'all. Did you hear me? It's time to fight. Now, you know, it did not even occur to me that you all may be doing a black history play or celebrating black history in, in a very pronounced way today and singing songs that have long been an anthem for black people. Because you know that a large part of that is we gotta fight. And this word, as, as God was giving it to me, I sat down for eight hours straight and did not stop writing. God had something that he wanted to say. And what he wanted to say is, is that it's time to fight. The life of a believer is war. And we've been asleep. I pose this question to you and to myself as well. Have you been fighting? Have you heard the message of the Bible? Have you really believed what Jesus said? We're at war. Yes, yes we are. I want you to turn to Genesis. I'm going to go ahead and warn you. I told you that I, I sat down and I wrote for eight hours. I don't plan on preaching for eight hours. Right. But right. if, if you help me out, we should get out of here soon. Right. But you're going to need your Bibles. Genesis, the fourth chapter, starting with the sixth verse, and for the interest of time, I will go ahead and read Genesis, 
the fourth chapter, the sixth through the seventh verse. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? And if you do well, do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Turn with me to Romans, the seventh chapter. Let's go to the 15th verse. Romans, the seventh chapter, and the 15th verse. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not, but the evil I will not to do that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God but with the flesh, the law of sin. We're at war, y'all. We're fighting a real battle with a real enemy. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, I do not fight as somebody who's beating the air. We're fighting a real fight with a real enemy whose desire is to kill me. The enemy is sin. But God says, we should fight. And the way to victory is in Jesus Christ. So I'd like to use as our topic today, it's killing time. It's killing time. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. It's killing time. Before we go any further, I'd like for us to agree on one thing. We can, degree, we can disagree on most anything else, but I urge you, if we don't see, even if we don't see each other again, that we agree on this, that we will listen critically to every word that proceeds from this pulpit, and that you will discern for yourself whether what has been said is true. Because this is a biblical mandate. First John 4 and 1 states, Behold, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Y'all, it's time out for immature Christians. It's time out for folks that blindly follow every new idea or preacher that comes on the scene. We've got to study for ourselves. We've got to grow up so that we can be effective in our work. Unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. If you agree, say amen. 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 Then we can go forward. Let's consider again our key text, Matthew eleven twelve, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Now let's read on to verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Mm -hmm. What's being said here is absolutely amazing to me. Yeah. Jesus is saying that all the scripture and all the people that came before were telling you what was coming, mm -hmm. what was going to happen, mm -hmm. but now it's here. It's happening. And it started when John the Baptist stepped on the scene. Scripture is being fulfilled in your very presence. I don't know about you, but that's exciting. Yeah. Come on. Come on. <laughs> now, I want you to test what's being said here. 
What did Jesus say in Luke 4.21 after reading the scroll of Isaiah? Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. But not only that, not only is Jesus saying that scripture is being fulfilled, that God is making good on his promise, but to get it, you've got to lay hold of it. Y'all need to, y'all need, y'all need to marinate on that for a second. That not only is God keeping his promise, but for you to get what he promised, you've got to lay hold of it. You've got to fight for it. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, I'm going to let a little Pastor Jones out in me. The words translated suffer violence in English is a compound word of sorts in the Greek. In the Greek, the word is biadzo. And there is a passive tense of the word, which means to be seized. So another fair reading of this verse would be that the kingdom of heaven is coming to be taken, and those who take it, take it by force. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. God's, offering it, God's offering it, but you've got to take it. You've, you've got, to take it. got to take it. Test again what's being said here. Turn with me to Luke 12, 30, 12 32. Luke 12, 32, I'm going to wait so that you have time to see this for yourself. Luke 12, 32, when you found it, say amen. In Luke 12, 32, it's written, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, if it's his good pleasure to give it to you, then the only reason you don't have it is because you didn't take it. So today we're going to discuss how to take hold of the kingdom. And there are three things that we need to do that. The first is we need to understand the mission. Say understand the mission. The second thing we need to know, we need to know how to fight. Say know how to fight. And the third thing is be equipped to fight. All right, didn't have to tell you the third time. In the interest of time, I will only touch briefly on each of these as, because as you know me, I don't believe it takes all day to tell the truth. And each of these points are a sermon in and of itself. However, if you indicate to me that you get it, we'll quickly move on. But if you look at me funny, you're going to add five minutes to the sermon. (laughs) I hear you, Felicia. Understand the mission. Understand the mission. Turn to 2 Timothy, the second chapter. I told you you were going to need your Bible. If you got it on your phone, hey, that's, that's, hey, that works too. 2 Timothy, the second chapter, and the fourth verse. Second Timothy the second chapter and the fourth verse. When you found it, say amen. Amen. And it reads, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. I'm going to read it again. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. I think I heard you say something like that this morning, Reverend Moore, didn't I? So the question is, after reading this verse, we are the soldiers. God is the one who enlisted us. So the question is, what pleases God? What does he want? What is the mission? Turn with me to Philippians 3.14. When you found it, say amen. Amen. And it's written, 
I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So I ask again, what pleases God? What does he want? What is our mission? It's Jesus. What pleases God? What does he want? What is our mission? The answer is Jesus. He wants children that love him, that love each other, and that will rule his creation well. That, by definition, is Jesus. Y'all gonna walk with me. God wants children that love him, that love each other, and that will rule his creation well. That's Jesus. What is the first and greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. And what's the second? To love your neighbor as yourself. That's what God wants. That's the mission. Now, I want you to test what's being said here. In Philippians 2 and 5, I'll let you find that on your own. But he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 29 said this, for whom he foreknew. This is one of my favorite scriptures, by the way. Matter of fact, it's this scripture is the reason why Roman has his name. Okay. And whom, oh yeah, by the way, Roman is my son. <laughs> and whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So I say it again, what pleases God? What does he want? What is our mission? Jesus. He wants children that love him, that love each other, and that will rule his creation well. Now, now that we know what the mission is, we need to understand that our mission is not without opposition. We've got an enemy. And our enemy is sin. Now, I want to be very practical. And we're in danger of becoming churchy when we use vocabulary that has little meaning outside of our church culture. So let's take a moment to define terms. What is sin? Here's Pastor Jones coming out again. In Hebrew, sin is the word hata, which means guilty, offense, missing the mark. But to make it plain and remain consistent with what this idea represents throughout scripture, I submit that sin is a desire for anything outside of God. Sin is a desire for anything outside of God. Of course, there is sin the noun, which is the thing, and the verb, which is the action, the noun is the desire for anything outside of God. And the verb is to act upon a desire for anything that's outside of God. So let's test what's being said here. You see a pattern here? We're going to test what's being said here. Turn with me to James 1, 1 I'm going to go ahead and read it. James 1, 1 reads, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Again, I submit to you that sin is a desire for anything outside of God. What did James just tell you? James just told you that you sin when you are led away by what you want. And when what you want is outside of God, it's not good. Because everything that is good is in God. We have an awful habit of identifying and harping on actions when sin actually takes place in the heart. We stay locked in a pattern of destructive behavior because we just focus, cry, and complain about the fruit, which is actions, but never lay the ax to the root of the tree, which is desire. 
Sin is a desire for anything outside of God. Okay. Now that we know that sin starts with desire, the next step is knowing how to fight. Know how to fight. See, so we moved through the first one pretty quick there. See, y'all helped me out. We're going to keep on moving. Now, since we learned that sin starts with the desire, it's important to be aware when we're being enticed, tempted, or propositioned. The first account that we have of temptation is the serpent tempting Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3 and 6 says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. But let's be clear. Satan wasn't selling Eve a magical fruit salad. Now I want you to read Genesis 3 through 4. Excuse me, Genesis, uh, the third chapter, the fourth through the fifth verse. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in you... That, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The real proposition that Satan is making here is to, he's saying, Eve, you can be God. What he's really tempting her with is that you can take the place of God. Now, what's more important is that Eve wanted that. And that's why she ate. Hear this. You can't be tempted with something you don't want. So the question is, how can we fight that? How can we resist temptation? Well, I'm glad you asked. Turn with me to Luke 4. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. Then the devil, taking him upon a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all of this will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Amen. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Yes. Jesus just gave you a clinic on how to fight sin. All right, sir. See, there's a lot here, but what I'd like for us to draw out of this passage is how Jesus responded to every temptation. Every time Satan offered something, Jesus countered with something God said. What I'd like to submit to you this morning is that Jesus was able to overcome every temptation because there was something he wanted more than anything Satan had to offer. Oh, y'all didn't catch that because if you did, you'd be, you'd be shouting. Simply put, Jesus said, I want what God offers more than anything you have to offer. This is how we fight. We got to test it. We got to test it. Don't believe what I say. Check out Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. I'm going to read it again. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus has sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus wanted more. Say he wanted more. Now, look how this plays out in our earlier passage. Satan offers him all the kingdoms of the world, but Jesus had his eyes on the universe, maybe even a multiverse. So offering Jesus all the kingdoms of the world is a little like an ant trying to tempt me by being the ruler of their anthill. Say there's a much bigger prize. There's a much bigger prize. But see, there's another tacit temptation that we'll miss if you don't really press into this passage. Remember how I said that Satan entices us with what we want? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Satan knows full well who he was dealing with. Right. He knew who Jesus was, yeah. and he knows what Jesus came to do. Yeah. He knows that Jesus is the Messiah, yeah. Savior of the world. Yeah. So Satan makes this offer. Hey, 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 hey. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to die. You came to save the world, didn't you? Well, I can just give it to you. But see, Jesus knew something more. See, Jesus, while, while Jesus knew that the objective was to bring the kingdom of God to the world, he also knew that the objective was to do away with evil forever. So Jesus was like, no, 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 no. It's not enough for me to get the world. I've got to put my foot on your neck. Jesus said, no deal. I want it all. As believers, we got to have that kind of attitude. I'm not going to take a piece of what you want to give me. Because I know what the promises are in Jesus Christ. I want it all. I don't want a wifey. Y'all got quiet on that. I don't want somebody to play house with. I want a wife. Too often we may compromise, but Jesus said, no, 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 no. I want it all. Oh, yeah. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Yeah. And that's what we have to do. How does that look in our daily lives? We have to remember what we want more in God. Mm -hmm. And we have to reject shortcuts that compromise the mission. I remember Mother Vaughn. She walked up to me one Sunday. She put her arms around me, looked me in the eye. She said, Reverend, you getting fat. <laughs> now, some of you all in this room don't, you didn't know me before. There was a point where I weighed more than 220 pounds. And she was absolutely right. She was absolutely right I was getting fat. My nephew that uh, stays with us from time to time, he says, Uncle Paul, you ain't got no neck. <laughs> but after, Miss, after Mother Vaughn told me about that, later on, it had really nothing to do with what she said, but I became convicted about the power food had over me and began to see the effects that it had on the things that I cared about. So I set my sights on honoring the Lord with my body and making sure that I was fit for service. But almost on a daily basis, I was met with the temptation of indulging my flesh with food, fried chicken, hamburgers, donuts, 
Banana pudding. Where Dana is. But see, it's easier for me to say no now because I want something more. I want to be able to play with my kids. I want to be able to chase my wife around the house. I want to feel good throughout the day. More importantly, I don't want the gospel that I preach to be undermined because if there's a God that you serve, why is it that he can't help you with self-control? I want something more. Since y'all being quiet on me, I might as well go ahead and take it all the way. Y'all can't get no quieter. As a man, I constantly deal with the sexualization of women. I see what she's got on. I get the promise of pleasure that she's trying to offer. But it's easier for me to say no now. Because I want something more. I want my wife to know she's safe. I want my children to know the love of God. I want that my children to know that he will not leave you nor forsake you because dad is not going to leave your mom, not even for a moment. I want the world to know that the father did send the son and how I love my wife. I want more. A key to effectively fighting sin is wanting more in God and rejecting any shortcuts that compromise the mission. And that leads to last but not least, see, we weren't long. We need to be equipped to fight. Let's look again at the beginning of Luke 4. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. The first thing that you need before going into any battle is the Holy Spirit. Right. I'll say it again because this is like going out to battle without a helmet or without body armor. The first thing you need before going into any battle is the Holy Spirit. Now, 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 we've got another one of those churchy words. So let's take a moment to define terms. What is the Holy Spirit? I submit to you that the Holy Spirit is a distinct manifestation of God. He is the part of God that makes humanity aware of his presence and gives us a sense, much like taste, touch, or sight, that allows us to experience and interact with God. Did y'all catch all that? The Holy Spirit makes humanity aware of his presence and gives us a sense, like sight, touch, taste, that allows us to experience and interact with God. Well, we got to test it again. We got to test it. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2 and 9. Yes. But as it is written, I has not seen, right. nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Right, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Yes. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Yes. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man? which is in him, even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit, we cannot know God. Without the Spirit, we can't even know Christ. We can't even see him. And without Christ, as he said in John 15 and 5, we can do nothing. So if you try to fight without the Holy Spirit, and let me tell you what that looks like. If you go out and get a book about marriage that tells you all kind of techniques and little things, checklists to do, but you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's going to fail. Without the Holy Spirit, you 
can do nothing. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. Acts 1, 1 through 5 reads as such. The former account I made, O Theophilus, and this is Luke speaking. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus said, don't go nowhere until the Holy Spirit comes. See, in my earlier example, I shared how I was tempted by food or sex, but these things appeal to the most base aspects of my humanity. They appeal, quite frankly, to the animal in me. But I want to be clear here about something, that there are higher levels of reasoning in my humanity. Even before we knew Christ, we were more than animals. So it is, possible, it is possible to not know Christ and want more than to satisfy your primal urges. I, I need you to know that. Because I don't want you to go around calling unbelievers animals. We were all created in the image of God. We were all created with the capacity to know God. However, when I did come to Christ, I received something special. I received a new consciousness, and with that came new appetites. I wanted things I never wanted before, such as righteousness, and that's another churchy word. Righteousness simply means I wanted to relate to everything in the right way at all times. I've often heard it as, how can I know that I'm really saved? I think a good indication is if you want different things, if you have new desires in Christ, it's a good sign that you are saved. Because the Bible says that any man being Christ Jesus is a new creature creature with new desires. So, the Holy Spirit is vital in laying hold of the kingdom. According to John 16, 13, the Holy Spirit is the one who will guide us into all truth. And how does he do that? Well, let's read John 16, 13 in its entirety. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So the question again is, How does the Holy Spirit guide us into all truth? Well, the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth through Jesus, the word in flesh. So practically, that means that we must study the scripture. But not only that, we really need to do better of allowing scripture to inform everything we think, do, or say. We need to be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 who search the scriptures every day to find out what these things mean. The last part of being equipped is you're not meant to go it alone. As you go to war, You need to find people who you know love you and give them permission to hold you accountable, to call you on your crap, and to correct you. Y'all way too quiet on that, so I'm going to say it again. You need 
people right. who love you, All right. who you know love you, and give them permission. Say, give them permission. Give them permission, give them permission to hold you accountable yes. and to correct you. That's called church. That's what the church is supposed to be about. But too often, we don't want nobody telling us nothing. But you cannot go to war alone. You know, I found Ebenezer to be such a place. I'll never forget. She stepped out now. But one Sunday, I was doing children's sermon, just like Ms. Lanfair was doing not too long ago. And my wife and I, ironically, were just talking about this a few seconds ago. Um, Chris has always been a social kid, always loved people, always loved to talk. And he would chatter during service, and he would always shoot up his hand because he wanted to pray during children's sermon. And one particular service, I got annoyed. I got annoyed because he had been talking. And, and I admonished him in front of everybody and, and told him no in a very harsh way. And I really didn't think much about it. But then one day, maybe two, three days later, Miss Minor comes to my office. I'm at work now. Miss Minor knocks on the door. I open the door. She comes in. She walks past me, past my desk. She goes to the guest room and she says, Paul, come here. Let's sit down. In my office now. She's going to tell me to have a seat in my office. And she told me, she called, she called me on the verse where it tells fathers not to provoke your children to wrath. She wasn't doing nothing but telling me the truth. And I want you to know, 